Welcome to the Behavior Speak podcast. Now, here's your host, Ben Ryman. Welcome to another episode of the Behavior Speak podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Ben Ryman. Uh, I'd like to first start by doing a, a, a quick acknowledgement um, of, of the lands where I'm uh, producing this podcast today. So I live on the uh, the lands of the Tlaman, Klahus, Homoko, and Comox First Nations. Uh, and these are kind of four First Nations that uh, were, uh, in, some folks might, in, in the old days, would call these reservations. Um, but now um, uh, they identify as First Nations, kind of independent nations. Um, and there's four of them kind of surrounding the area and, and on kind of the central kind of west coast of British Columbia. Um, and, uh, those four nations were actually one entire community for thousands and thousands of years until, you know, my ancestors, um, came over here and essentially separated them and moved them onto these reservations as they called them, uh, put the Indian act into place, which was essentially a way of, uh, of controlling the folks. Um, in fact, the, uh, the city that I... I live on an island called Texada Island, which is named after a Spanish colonist conqueror and uh, uh, who who actually never even came here, had nothing to do with the island, but for whatever reason, they named it after him. But it's actually called uh, Sayayin in the Tlaman language. Um, and again, I, and I live in a village called Gillies Bay, which again, named after no one that has ever lived here, um, was actually called Isam in the Tlaman language. Um, and we're very close to a place called Powell River, which um, also has a lot of issues. Uh, Powell uh, being a, a guy named Israel Powell, who is sort of essentially in charge of removing all these folks and, and sending them to all these areas. So there's been a lot of work to kind of rename Powell River to something else, to something that's more uh, acknowledging of uh, the Tlaman folk and the Tlaman people. And I support that that name change, and I'm trying to kind of work with those folks. So I just want to say that I'm grateful to be on these lands and grateful to uh, the First Nation communities I've been able to connect with and and, and hope to kind of keep going there. Uh, and for folks that are listening, this this will probably be the maybe the second land acknowledgement that I've done on this podcast. I'm going to try to keep it going um, for every episode and try to make it a little different every time. Um, based on some of my learning. So I hope folks enjoy that and uh, get something from it and maybe uh, try to go do a little bit of learning about, um, uh, you know, where the area is there from and the lands that, uh, you know, and, and sort of who occupied those lands before before we got there. But I won't keep my guests waiting any longer. Uh, I've got uh, Kaylin Partlow on the show today. Kaylin, welcome. Thank you. Kaylin is a... Is a, is a interesting individual that uh, I, I actually came across um, on social media. I, 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 I saw her uh, contributing in one of the kind of ABA Facebook groups I'm on. Um, and it's interesting. Most folks will probably know her from uh, um, the, the recent, I think it was a May release of the, the Netflix show, uh, Love on the Spectrum US. Uh, and I, I highly encourage folks to go out and check, just, just, just look, her, look her up on YouTube. Uh, you'll find some great interviews. I saw one uh, recently with uh, uh, I forget the name. Of it, but I, think the, I think the host name was Rick, maybe um, Ryan, Ryan Bailey. Bailey. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, and I think I think he does a pretty good job of uh, of asking all the all the right questions about uh, about your experience on the show and and can really you know really dives deep into sort of dating and those sorts of pieces. The reason I have Kaylin on the show is because she's also in the field of ABA. And I kind of, and I really wanted to share with, uh, uh, you know, uh, the folks that are listening, some of the good work and perspectives Kaylin has as both an autistic individual herself, but also uh, an ABA practitioner um, uh, in line with uh, a lot of some, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, discussion lately and a lot of discussion on the episodes that I've done uh, previously around areas of like ABA reform, which we, we might, which I think we'll, we'll, we'll dive into a little bit today. Um, and, uh, I think the big message through all of that, there's a lot of really kind of vitriol arguments happening, particularly online, 
uh, you know, it's almost a almost a, a right wing, left wing kind of thing. It seems um, where, you know, some folks are are very strong and you know and, and you know, uh, for lack of a better term, fairly aggressive online um, towards other folks. Um, and then there's other groups of autistics um, um, that are you know sort of you know just staying out of it entirely. Um, and there's other folks that are sort of trying to you know, say, well, listen, there are, there are some good things happening. Um, um, and, you know, we kind of need to be thinking about those things. And I know, and I know when I spoke with Kaylin earlier, she definitely has a, a perspective on this, which I think is unique and, and welcomed. Um, uh, we know that, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, the, the classic phrase of, of one person with autism is one person with autism, one autistic is one autistic. And one human is one human. Everyone's going to have, you know, their own perspective on things. And uh, just because, you know, a few loud voices on social media um, shout something out, that doesn't necessarily mean that's the perspective of the whole community. And is there even a community perspective? And these might be other things we might even kind of kind of dive into today. Um, I really liked, uh, K- Kaylin is, and I think thanks in part to, to, to the, the Love on the Spectrum sort of, um, um, exposure kaylin has got some really cool social media uh groups uh or not groups sorry yeah sort of uh, accounts if this is the term um uh and 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 i'll stop talking about you the third person you're doing a really good job um um i think disseminating um you know the autistic experience as it were you know i think you're using really nice simple language really good examples um and you put one out um, just recently uh, uh, on, uh, I believe, and, and forgive forgive my lack of social media jargon. I believe they call these reels. Is that what they call them? Um, <laughs> yeah, on Instagram. Yeah. It's so funny that they call them reels because real comes from you know movies from the forties when they were on the you know the reel. So I don't know. Anyway, it's interesting that the kids mm-hmm. today have decided to call them reels. Uh, but uh, <laughs> um. um uh, these are essentially, uh, if folks, I don't know if folks are, some folks will be familiar with TikTok, which I think is essentially just a real R-E-E-L uh, application. There's those short little videos, you know, 10, 20 seconds long or whatever. Um, but you can also do these kind of reels on Instagram and, and, and Facebook as well. Um, and you released one, uh, uh, it, I, I don't think it was that long ago. It came up with my feed, so I presume it was a newer one around uh, comparing... Um, uh, around the term special needs, which I thought was really awesome. Um, uh, and really makes me kind of think about the degree I have back here. I have a master's in special education. And I think, you know, I, I think it, it won't be very long before I look at that degree and go, wow, I, 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 I wish I could black that term out and, and, and put something else in there because you're right. You know, uh, you point out that, you know, they're not special needs they're human needs. And, and I think, you know, in in the similar way, it's not necessarily you know, autistic perspectives. These are just human perspectives, um, and uh, I think you know we have that kind of separation. Anyway, I'll stop rambling on here. Um, let's let's, uh, Kaylin. I, I think a lot of folks are familiar again with with the love on the spectrum piece, and and you know, and and your sharing of autism piece. But there was a, there's been a little tidbits in some of those um, uh, presentations that you know you work with kids. Um, I think is is a phrase that was we heard a lot. Um, uh, uh, Ryan mentioned um, uh, you were a, a therapist with children, but again, uh, uh, I haven't really heard anyone kind of dive deeper into that. And so, how I found Caitlin, Caitlin was um, um, uh, again, like I said, in an ABA group, and discovered uh, she's uh, what we call a registered behavior technician. Um, which uh, has a few different names depending on where you're from in Canada. We, we often call them behavior interventionists. I hear a lot of folks in the States referring to them as sort of behavior therapists or child therapists, lots of different terms, but uh, uh, the RBT is essentially the, the uh, for folks that maybe are listening today that are, you know, here more for Kaylin and less here for behavior analysis. Uh, the RBT is essentially our, our, our base kind of um, 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 uh, credential. Uh, in our field um, and it is a credential you have to take some training and write an exam and have continuous supervision and so on and so forth to to, to maintain that credential 
um, and it tends to be sort of the uh, the gateway, as it were, to folks becoming uh, you know board certified behavior analysts and, and and other things like that. And we're going to talk a little bit about sort of that area as well and your aspirations towards that. So maybe uh, to get started, I always like to get a bit of an origin story of kind of how folks got into the ABA field. I know you've been doing this for seven years, I think, is what you, you said when we mm-hmm. talked last. So, you know, that would put you kind of starting this, you know, essentially as early as, as folks are legally allowed to be RBTs, I think 18 or 19, I don't, it, depend, it may depend on the state you're in. Um, Part of it's probably going to be obvious. I mean, you are artistic, and you've had an, and you've had and you've had uh, you know experiences in that regard. Um, actually, before I even go there, um, there is also the identity identity piece, um, and um, and there's debates on either end around this, around um, you know um, person first versus identity first language, and uh, you know I've been trying to just use identity first language a lot more lately because it seems like what most folks have been preferring, but I think it's, I, I, but I, but I apologize because I think what, what's best is to always ask the individual what they prefer. And I didn't do that. I just kind of jumped right in. So I apologize for that. What, what is your preference there? I guess I'm kind of an oddball here. I don't have a strong preference either way. I use them both interchangeably. Mm. Um, I was talking to someone about this earlier that you know, I didn't think that I really had a strong preference until someone said that they had a strong preference for person first. Mm. And so I did some I did some research on it. Um, and someone there's a quote somewhere that someone had said, if you have to do linguistic gymnastics to remind yourself that I am a person, then you're the one with a problem, not me. <laughs> um, and I thought that was really, really insightful. Yeah. And so while I still don't have a strong preference and I do use them interchangeably, I guess what I don't like is having the preference for only person first, if that Mm, makes sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Interchangeable. That works for me. Um, Because there's definitely groups of folks that are are highly offended by one term or the other. Um, And so I I think it is important to check in either way. It's, It's similar, I suppose, in some ways to sort of the the pronouns and, uh, and, and, and kind of, yeah, it is similar. I think connecting on, on, on that piece. I also know that in terms of, and, and you'll obviously you'll have some experience with just training and whatnot and, and, and education, but, um, in schools, uh, they really insist we use person first language. uh, And that seems to be sort of the academic perspective. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm, I presented at a conference recently, um, and the actual conference presenter said that my presentation had to have person first language only, and I wasn't allowed to use identity first language. Of course, then I riddled it with identity first language just because it was pre it was pre recorded <laughs> and there was really nothing they could do about it. But um, um, but uh, it, it's it's interesting that sort of uh, there's sort of uh, you know those those perspectives. But I I, I like that idea of of of, of you know. If, if, if you got to do all this to just recognize that you're a human being, then there, there's, you know, there's some bigger issues that are good play. So as an autistic individual or a person with autism, my point was going to be that one might think, OK, you, you got into the field just because you're autistic. But there's lots of autistic folks that aren't in the field. Um, I think there's lots of barriers for autistic folk getting into the field. Um, and I think, you know, um, you know, uh, there's really a, call, a bit of big call lately. I think more so in the last couple of years for more, you no, know, uh, maybe for the broader term, folks that are kind of neurodiverse to become practitioners in the field and really kind of have that, you know, lived experience perspective. But what can you maybe tell us why why you got into ABA or how? Yeah. So it's my story is unusual, Perfect. and I would be really surprised if somebody else had something similar. So um, I was homeschooled kind of on and off throughout my childhood. Um, And then for high school, just because that's kind of the age where girls start to butt heads with their mothers, right? So homeschool was maybe not going to work out for (laughs) us. Um, She, just due to my learning disabilities, I wasn't going to be able to do well in a public school. Um, And a lot of the private schools were really heavily academic focused. So we had found Hope Academy, um, which is a school only for people on the spectrum. 
And so I started attending class there and I, I graduated high school. And it's actually the same company that I am currently employed oh. by. So in total, I have been here since I was 13 years old and I'm 25 now. Wow. Okay. So you've got that. Yeah, that is a unique perspective because I've definitely heard of, you know, the perspective of some folks, you know, receiving ABA services and then getting into the field. But I haven't heard of anyone receiving ABA services and then being employed by that service provider. Um, that, that's really interesting. Uh, and so what, what was it about that experience then that, that, that made you want to do this as a career? I just, I guess I really, I, someone asked me if I had always wanted to do this and the answer Mm -hmm. is no. Um, I didn't know. I mean, I, I'm the oldest child, so I knew to a degree that I was more or less, I was good with my younger siblings. Um, but I didn't know that I was good with kids in general until shortly before graduating high school, just because I had a lot of interactions with the younger kids at the Mm. school. Um, and so they kind of recognized that I had that ability. And then somebody sat down and met with me and was like, Hey, you could do this for a Mm. living. Um, and my entire senior year of high school was focused on developing the skills necessary to kind of be employable Mm. and also the skills to be able to be an RBT. And so, so what did that look like? Like, what, what, what do you mean by developing the skills to be employable? What, what were you doing there? There was a lot of um, time management that went into it because I got my driver's license mm-hmm. at 16. So I had to drive myself to school and I had to get there on time as if it were a job and there was somebody there monitoring right. that. Um, and I did kind of what they called internships. And it was actually pay, it was paid, believe it or not, um, mm-hmm. to show up to the preschool class and they would have the preschool teachers, and then they would have the one-on-one aides. And my job would vary depending on the day, but I had a schedule to follow where I would either, you know, complete a certain amount of tasks, or I would have to ask somebody for a task to give me to complete. And then that person would then have to initial that I had done that. Um, I don't know if they just thought I would like skip out on it or not complete it, but it was, it was just kind of a way of self-monitoring, I guess, um, and some accountability in there as well. And then this was kind of back before punishment was, was um, more widely talked about and definitely not as well accepted. Um, but being a teenager, being a high school student, I kind of had a mouth on me, you know, so I would say some snappy comment or some rude remark. And then the preschool teacher would go dump out the bookshelf and say, all right, you're going to sort these books and come back when you're done. But you know what? I really learned how to kind of control the things that I say. Um, of course, none of us are are perfect at it, but it was kind of a a wake up call, I would say. Mm Um, and it ultimately was really helpful in staying employed. And did you kind of not realize that what you were saying was inappropriate or was it more, you knew it was and you just didn't, didn't. Eh, didn't. It would depend on the day. <laughs> A little bit of both sometimes. <laughs> right on, right on. And you were, you were diagnosed, was it age 10 you said? But then mm-hmm. I believe when I was listening to Ryan Bailey, you actually your folks didn't let you know until a little bit later. Is that, is that right? Right. So yeah, they, they told me I had dyslexia when I was 10. Um, and they had kind of, I had heard the word autism. I think at that point it would, they were saying Asperger Mm. still. Um, and I had heard them, you know, kind of say that they would throw that word around, but I, I I guess I had a, like a vague idea of what it might be, but I, they never really sat me down and gave me any kind of real definitions until I was 13. And and that's when you went, uh, went to, what's it called? Hope, Hope Bridge. Is that what it was called? Hope, Hope Academy, Academy, but it, we're yeah, we're Hope, Hope Reach now. Reach. Gotcha. Okay. Mm-hmm. Project Hope. Project Hope. Lots of hope. Um, and so basically, was was it sort of we got to tell her before we send her to the school? Was that sort of the the impetus there? Yeah, that was that was kind of the the attitude yeah. for sure. I, uh, the 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 other students in my class at the time. Um, did not have the same communication skills that I did. So I kind of think they had to prep me for that Mm. um, just because I was the one who had the most communication of, you know, everybody Mm -hmm. there. When I say everybody, I mean like four or five other Mm -hmm. students. So there weren't very many of us. It was a smaller program at the time. Was that a, was that a a struggle for you as far as um, not so much like learning the diagnosis? I mean, that's going to be, you know, um, um, this or that, but as far as being in a, in a program where you're dealing with folks that have a lot more human needs uh, than, than you do. Yeah, it was definitely difficult because 
you know, one thing I've heard people say online and I identify with this as well is like when you have a lot of communication skills, you're kind of too weird to be normal, but too normal to be weird. Um, (laughs) which is just to say that I didn't really fit in with my typical peers, but I certainly didn't fit in with the students with the specialized placements Mm -hmm. either. Um, and so because I had more ability than they did and they needed, you know, more support with certain things, I was expected to be the role model at all times. I was expected Mm. to be the one who not only was the role model, but also sometimes would provide that support, you know, in, in a way that a peer Mm. could, um, which I was, I'm glad to help, but it it was challenging at the time. Talk about, you know, prepping for employment early in the game. eh? You were essentially building those, those therapist skills from age 13, right? Until, you know, I mean, again, again, for folks that aren't familiar with sort of that RBT credential, uh, the requirement for training is, is, is a 40 hour course. Is that still the case? Right. Yeah. So, Mm -hmm. you know, that's not a lot, you know, um, uh, you know, you, you essentially can graduate from high school and, uh, take a course for 40 hours, which is essentially a week long course. If you do it, you know, consecutively, and then you're, you're, you're into practice. Um, but you, on the other hand, had essentially five years more of training, uh, before that happened. Um, uh, do you notice that effect? I mean, like, like, did you think that that made a big, a big, a big difference? Oh, absolutely. Um, in addition to a lot of the hands-on experience during the academic portion of my day, they would give me different assignments to watch different videos. I'd watch like Yale lectures online or whatever about, you know, behaviorism, just kind of in general or psychology were kind of the options. So you can learn about behaviorism or you can learn about psychology. Which one do you want today? Um, so I came in knowing a lot. I'm really good at terminology. Um, you know, so yeah, it's definitely given me an advantage. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and, and, and I told you before we started that I was a little nervous about doing this interview. One reason I one reason I'm nervous about it is is something you had mentioned uh, I think on the show, on on the Spectrum show was uh, your 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 struggle with uh, awkward pauses, um, and, and and so I'm 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 uh, I'm trying to avoid those as much as I can. I'm engaging engaging in pause escape promoted behavior try and come up with things to say so I don't give you any awkward pauses. So forgive me if I yeah, I'll be all right. <laughs> if I slow down a bit. Folks folks who have been on the show before with notice that I tend to sort of um and ah quite a bit as I try to kind of get to the point here. Um so you've been doing RBT work. Uh did you so did you become an RBT sort of sort of right away or did, were you practicing for a while and then kind of got into that? I I graduated in April or May, and I was employed by summer schedules, so it, there was a couple months right. in between. And did, but did you actually do the RBT sort of coursework right then, or is that something you did a little later on in the in the in the? We didn't have it become a requirement for us until twenty sixteen or mm. twenty seventeen. Um, so once it became a requirement for the insurance providers, is when everybody had to do it. Oh, I see insurance providers. Yes. Uh Again, being in Canada, we we know nothing about insurance mandates and insurance requirements. Uh, the the funding for for services works so much differently. Um, so, just tell me a bit about what the kind of work you're doing and the, and, and and sort of the setting you're in. Is is this a clinic setting or do you do at home work? Um, what 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 are what what what's a, what what what's a, what's a day look like for? If you're planning on collecting continuing education credits for this episode, you'll need to enter the three secret words at www.cbiconsultants.com forward slash shop. The first secret word is spectrum. It's kind of mixed because I think a lot of people have, you know, they're either working in a school or they're working in a clinic or they're working in homes. Um, our clinic is a school, Mm. so we provide academic services to kids. They can graduate here from high school. Um, so the day structure is there's half of their day is academic. And then the other half is ABA Mm. sessions. So your client is going to maybe be with you for half the day, but then when, when that time is up, they're going to go to the classroom and then you're going to get the client who just came from the classroom. So you have like, you actually have like certified teachers in there then, uh, that are, that are Mm -hmm. doing that sort of piece. And, uh, 
And and so when you graduated from high school, did you get? And in in Canada we have, or at least in in in, in the province that I live, then they have, for whatever reason, they name high school diplomas after trees. And um, <laughs> yeah, I don't get it. Um, and uh, 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 and the the dogwood uh, is the standard high school diploma. There's another tree <laughs> that, that is sort of the you know modified adapted here's your piece of paper but really you didn't graduate from high school um you, i assume you got the full on high school diploma kind of thing yes yep. um, mm-hmm. um so that, that's great and and, and uh, you know i think that's something that 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 that's cuz i think a lot of these kids it's sort of end up in sort of these clinic settings but they don't get sort of that uh, that opportunity for for, for true academics, how do they do, do they do things? Sort and I don't again. I'm asking these questions. I don't know much about sort of um, uh, these sort of autism schools. I know of a couple locally, but I, I have never talked to anyone that worked there. Um, how does that work? How do they how do they structure things or set things up so that you can meet the requirements to graduate? Because there seems to be a lot of barriers for you know autistic folk in sort of regular high school to actually achieve graduation. Yeah, for do you mean like for a time like in terms of time because it's only a half day? Well, no, in, ter- in terms of I guess meeting all the requirements to graduate, you know, because it seems like you know there's essentially you know because folks will have you know and and and, and you're and and, you, and you've already said you're kind of one of them. Folks will often have a lot of learning disabilities associated, you know, other hidden sorts of you know uh, you know um, skill not skill deficits, but, you know, um, um, neurological issues that prevent them from either, you know, reading numbers or reading letters or, you know, sitting still in class or whatever. And, and, and these, and these sorts of issues tend to, you know, in, in, in sort of a, a regular high school setting, usually end up getting you kicked out of the classroom or, or in the hallway or in the office or getting sent home or, or, or just not getting attended to by the teacher or whatnot. There's lots of things going, different things going on in typical schools. What kind of happens in, in, in your school, you know, that, you know, that really supports and ensures folks are, 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 you know, going to get to graduate with a real high school diploma uh, you know, meet all those requirements um, uh, while at the same time, you know, knowing there's a lot of these barriers. Yeah, we give a lot of academic support. So there's still accommodations. There's still behavioral support. So if you need a one-to-one, mm. that can be arranged pretty easily. Class sizes are very small. I think the largest class we have is like four students. Oh. Um, so everybody gets a lot of one-on-one attention with the teacher. Yeah, And so is that like a... a and so for you, I guess, so did your folks have to pay for that or did insurance pay for the school or how did that work? No, my parents had to pay tuition because I did not receive ABA services at the time. It was just the education program. And so if I were just a couple years younger, I would have been on the receiving end of ABA mm. services. Um, so they had restructured the program. So now that it's, you can get both mm. basically. So you have, you never had ABA services as, 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 as no. a child. Um, no. And, uh, and then even through the whole, your whole sort of school life, you were just doing the academic side of things, uh, right. but you still had all those, you know, accommodations and supports and small class size and all those kinds of pieces. Uh, really cool. Um, what, uh, what's, uh, the, the, the kind of, um, model, I suppose that, 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 that you use in your work. You know, it's like some folks are kind of really heavy into like uh, discrete trial training. Other folks do, you know, natural environment teaching. Some folks do. I work with adults primarily, so I'm just trying to roll the the names off the tongues. A lot of the folks, some folks do these these sort of these NDBIs, so uh, naturalistic developmental behavior interventions. So like early start Denver model or PRT or, uh, you know, I think there's a, a couple others like that out there. What what's the sort of, you know approach at at at, uh, at uh, project hope it depends on who your client is um but i think generally you, it's a pretty good mix of dtt and mm, net gotcha gotcha and then you had mentioned you also do 
some of that uh some of that the sbt stuff is that right it's, it's, yes i have implemented SBT. and so how does that fit into the the dtt and the net and and uh you know we'll we'll uh i'll provide uh i promise to provide uh in the show notes uh uh meetings for these abbreviations for the folks that may not know what we're talking about so the universal protocols which is have you seen that from Greg Hanley, or from his team, I guess. I've I've heard of I, I saw Doctor Ruppel talk a little bit about the Universal Protocols once, but I don't know much about them. Yeah, I think that's kind of how we fit in the SBT with the DTT and the NET. Um, is I think we're making a bigger shift towards adopting these Universal Protocols, which is basically just at its core, be a be a good human mm, kind of mm. thing. Um, you know, we're respecting clients' dignity, which is not to say that we haven't before. It's just that we're, you know, more intentional about it, mm. I suppose. Um, so if somebody is withdrawing their consent to an activity, you know, you're honoring mm. that, right? You're not pushing them through mm. it, which is, again, not to say that we're, you know, oh, you don't want to do it. We don't have to kind of thing. But if, it, if somebody is experiencing some kind of, you know, pain or, you know, intense displeasure with an activity, we're not going to force them to continue mm-hmm. on with that. And so that's, I guess that's what they talk about, uh, ascent based kind of therapy. Mm-hmm. So how do you, how do you assess that? Uh, you know, the, uh, whether, whether someone is sort of lacking ascent versus, you know, just, I, I don't want to do math, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, it's not ascent, but it's, it's just, I'm not interested. Right. I mean, I think it has a lot to do with motivation and kind of like, maybe the reasoning behind their protest. Um, you know, math probably sucks. You're probably right, but we still have to do it. And here's yeah, why. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Um, does, um, well, first off, are there any other autistic folk working there? Not yeah, currently. and so does that. So, so do, do you have any kind of role there that sort of, um, you know, you know, take essentially takes advantage of your lived experience? I mean, I think I think there's there's something to be said about having, you know, staff on hand that are that are you know have that lived experience, and we're starting to see that a little bit. I think that the problem has been. It doesn't sound like this is the case for you. It sounds like you're you know, uh, you know, a regular employee do all the same sort of uh, tasks and requirements that, you know, the NT folk do and whatnot, you know, um, 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 you're, 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 you know, you're a regular employee of the company, but I, I often see, you know, companies that will sort of almost, it's almost like a performative kind of thing. Well, they'll, they'll, they'll hire the autistic individual, but then they, or, or, or the individual or any individual with some sort of, you know, maybe an intellectual disability, and I know those aren't one and the same, um, uh, uh, but they end up kind of becoming like a mascot, you know, or sort of someone in the picture that gets in the, you know, gets in the, gets in the flyer or the magazine or the website, but they don't end up doing, you know, a whole lot, um, um, uh, which, you know, I think is problematic. And then other times you'll get folks that are, you know, um, you know, maybe have, you know, a, a disability of some sort, and they're just doing the work. And then... On another level, you have folks that are actually involved in being, you know, um, sort of a consultant to the company itself. Like, I, I you know, I, I'm the one autistic person here. I've got a perspective here that, you know, that, you know, can really shape the way we're providing services. And they're, you know, we're, we're hearing a lot about neurodiversity affirming services being a thing. But I think a lot of people still don't really know what that means. Um, um, and, uh, so are, 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 do, do, does Project Hope have you involved in that kind of work as well and advocacy and that sort of thing? Yeah, definitely. I, you know, several times a week, supervisors are coming to me as an RBP saying, you know, Hey, I'm thinking about writing this program or, Hey, I've got this client who's, you know, having trouble with this thing. What do you think about mm, this? Love that. Um, and it's, they're not just asking just to ask, they're asking because they really value my yeah, response. Yeah, yeah. And I wonder in terms of sort of, because I think a lot about the, the ascent piece um, and, 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 uh, and, and sort of how folks assess that um, are, 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 again, I think, you know, and, and again, I, I look back to one of your, again, the one of your reels um, uh, where you're talking about um, um, 
the pain associated with the, the loud noises and whatnot and that, that ear stabbing piece. And I think, again, I think that was just such a, an amazing video that I think resonated with a lot of folks because, um, uh, you know, uh, just uh, you describe it in such simple terms. Um, but you really, you really put it out there that there are, you know, I think we've always known that, you know, autistic folk have sensory needs, sensory issues, but so does everybody else. And then sometimes we do that sort of analogy, like a, you know, I join a pen and that's how we, or I tap my finger or whatever. And so that, that's the same idea they say, but, but really it's not the same. I mean, I mean, uh, you, you know, it, it's not just that, you know, you need to tap your finger or, or, or you, you know, you, you want to muffle up the sound so you have less distractions. I mean, I have ADHD. So for me, that's all the, the sound sort of canceling headphones and whatnot are just so I can maintain more focus, but the loud noises in of themselves don't really bother me i mean beyond you know putting my head against a speaker and actually feeling you know my brain thumping or whatnot um um does are, are people looking to you and are you providing that that sort of uh you know uh, advice so that people understand that you know around in designing the environment and all those sorts of pieces sort of you know it's it's quite like for example it's quite possible that joey here is is refusing to participate because he's literally feeling massive amounts of pain or or whatnot like are, are you able to kind of provide that perspective and 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 for folks oh yeah i think so i think for our school being so small mm. that we maybe don't encounter that a whole lot so it's already just naturally very sensory friendly you know if your class is only four other kids mm. And, you know, someone is screaming. Yes, the screaming would be the problem. So it would be fairly obvious. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. So, but yeah, we're naturally pretty sensory. Friendly. And, uh, maybe tell me a little bit about that. Like what makes you, makes it sensory friendly? I mean, obviously having four, four folks in there that, that the, you know, the, the noise of crowd is definitely diminished a lot. That's pretty obvious. What, what other things are folks doing? Because I'm just, I'm just looking, I'm looking, I'm sort of looking at your background right now. Um, and I'm looking at sort of the lighting behind you. Um, and you know, I, I know we, there, we used to have, I, uh, when I, when I was doing my master's degree, we had a autistic, uh, fella come and speak to the class and, and he used to talk about, uh, the, the, those long light bulbs that are kind of up there oh, the Thank you. Yeah, lights. that are yeah. up there behind you. And that, and that, um, you know, for him, you know, well, well, you can't, well, I can't tell. He could actually see those lights flickering where others couldn't, or he could, he could, he knew sort of which bulbs would, would hurt him and which bulbs didn't hurt him. Like he was really knowledgeable about the bulbs, um, probably more so than a lot of folks. Um, um, and, and that there were a lot of these sort of standard kind of design things in classrooms that are always problematic from that sensory perspective. Um, uh, but is that the case? Because it looks like you have those lights up there. <laughs> yeah, we do. I mean, a lot of our students are not bothered mm. by them. Um, but then I think there are some days that it does bother some people sometimes. Yeah. Um, and you'll if you'll walk around, you know, looking at the classrooms, nine times out of ten, at least one of the classrooms will be conducting class with the lights off and the windows yeah. open. Um, so just the natural source of nice. light. What other things are you, you doing to make things sensory friendly, as it were? Well, there's adaptive seating. There's, you know, if you can't sit still through this class, you can get up and take mm. a walk and, you know, no judgment, no questions mm. asked kind mm. of thing. Just let us know mm. where you're going. Um, headphones for people who are particularly sensitive to that, mm. you know, that mm. sort of thing. Right on, right on. Um, so what, um, what are some of your kind of more, uh, you know, long-term goals here you've been rb you've been rbt for seven years now i don't think a lot of folks rb you know i don't think rbt is a verb but i don't think a lot of folks yes it is. i don't think a lot of folks rbt a lot uh for for that many years before either um unless they're either the only folks i see doing that are either folks that are you know, maybe a little unethical and going off and starting their own companies as RBTs and not, you know, continuing to get those credentials, um, you know, or they these are just folks that are kind of doing it as a side gig. But I, I, this sounds like, it sounds like you're pretty serious about this and you've been doing this a long time. Are you planning on, you know, doing more with this? 
Yes and no. I mean, ideally, you know, it'd be nice to go to school and be a BCBA. Um, it's just there's so many barriers in place for that to be reasonable that I've kind of taken that off the table at this point. So maybe if you don't mind talking about it a bit, because I think there's a lot of folks listening here that are that are instructional designers, they're academics, they're university professors, they're folks that that are essentially designing these programs and and uh, and and deciding kind of who gets in and doesn't get in. What what are those barriers? Because I think I think it's I think it's um, well, it's just plain ridiculous and awful that that you know someone like yourself who's clearly you know highly intelligent um, gets the field, knows your stuff really well. You know, I I know you and I talked um, uh, uh, a couple of weeks back, and you said you've even done some of the mock exams. Um, you know, and, and had no problems with them, you know, and you haven't even gone to, you haven't even gone to get a master's degree yet. And you're already passing the, the study exams for the BCBA. Um, um, it doesn't make sense to me that you can't become a BCBA. What, what, what's preventing that? What are those barriers? Well, in order to even get started, in order to even just get a bachelor's degree, you would need to get those gen ed requirements at a university and, until I can wake up one day and do numbers, there's just, there's no way that they're going to make any sort of exception or substitution and no amount of, you know, task cards or calculators is really going to help with the fact that I can't add or subtract beyond a second or third grade mm -hmm. level. And that's related to a learning disability that you have. What What's that? Right. And I kind of... Is that dyscalculia? Um, is that, that that's called? Yeah, dyscalculia. Right. And I kind of think that I'm in a unusual if not unique situation where people with my degree of learning disabilities are you know it usually comes with some sort of cognitive mm -hmm. or intellectual impairment as well especially you know in terms of communication and for whatever reason I didn't get that piece mm -hmm. and so you know I I sound fairly typical I would think yep. um and so people wouldn't believe and people don't believe they'll say, oh, you're so smart. I can tell you're so smart. Surely you'll be able to do this thing if you just mm -hmm. apply yourself or if you just get accommodations. And the truth is, that's not how it works. I've tried. Yeah. yeah. What can you just tell me a little bit more? I don't know if, if this is a U.S. thing uh, and that, that I just don't know about. What, 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 what do you mean by gen ed requirements? What, what are those? So before you can kind of study, you know, your your topic of interest, your, your chosen mm -hmm. field, you have to take these general education classes. Mm -hmm. um, so that's your history, your science, your math, your, you know, just what basically whatever you did in high school, but harder um, is is kind of what that is. Really? See. And that's for two years. It's not like a class like that's for the first two years. So you have to do that for like a long time. So essentially they're forcing you to. So you you have you have an interest you know what you want you know the direction you want to go you want to do, you know. I don't I I suppose that you may, maybe it's a BA in psych or something you know to sort of eventually go on and and do a master's degree and and become a BCBA, you know that's your career path you know where you're set on, um, and yet, the university still. Puts you through through this sort of high school esque college prep thing where they don't think they're essentially implying you're not able to make decisions about your career right now. And, and you have to take two years of stuff that you're never going to use um, and then yep. make that decision. And that, wow. That, that seems, that seems pretty discriminatory, you know? Yeah. But I mean, that's everywhere. That's not just one school. That's everywhere. everywhere. Here. Because I know, I mean, I know for me, when I did my undergrad, um, you know, I I did a BA in psych and, you know, I took intro psych and I took, you know, I th maybe it, maybe it was because that's there, there maybe because there's not enough, enough specific level one courses or something. Uh, yeah. It's, that's really strange to me that they would sort of kind of make you do that. Um, um, so is that the big barrier? So say, so if you say didn't have to take a math course in university, do you think you'd be fine for the most part? Yeah, Maybe. it's possible. Hey, eh? hmm. wow. So, so what, what, so, so, you know, and, and I don't, I don't want to get sort of too depressing here. What, what, so what does that, 
give you as far as a career outlook? I mean, they're really, they're, there's a lot of talk about sort of, you know, uh, providing employment opportunities for folks. And, you know, I think there's a something like a 90% unemployment rate for, you know, autistic folk, um, um, uh, particularly those with intellectual disabilities, it's even higher. Um, um, but if the reason for that is barriers like this, that literally make no sense at all like people are going to make a sort of stigma assumptions about you you know you know that you know that she's not smart she's you know she can't do these things that's why she can't get in university where it's you know that's got nothing to do with anything it's just it it, it you know it's you've got a neurological thing um for a, a course you're like you've, you've, you've never had a dream to be a mathematician it'd be different if your goal in life was to be a mathematician and you wanted to kind of get through that but um it just seems you know so what what where does that leave you what kind of options if, if you say you want to keep kind of staying in this field doing this kind of work are, are there are there options for you i mean you better just hope that the pay for rbt increases alongside the cost of living yeah. wow huh oh, that's terrible um well you know i i do have in uh you know uh a guest coming on um soon uh, and so hopefully we're going to start to see some changes here. I have a guest coming on, Dr. Syed, um, and uh, from uh, Dr. Noor Syed from uh, uh, New York. Uh, and I know she's working on some kind of program in the university. She's at, I don't know if it's at Columbia or another one nearby uh, where they're trying to, uh, no, it's, it's uh, Sunny, Sunny. So State University of New York Empire, I believe. Uh, where they're trying to develop sort of a, uh, you know, an inclusive autistic program for universities so that, you know, folks could essentially um, create their own degree program um, and decide all the courses they want to take towards that degree program. Maybe something like that could be, you know, it could 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 work for folks if if it kind of gets off the ground because it sounds like that's exactly kind of what you're looking for, you know, is is how can I take a bachelor's degree in what I'm interested in, you know, without without taking the stuff right. I'm not interested in and I'm not going to do well in, um, you know, it'd, right. be, it'd be like sending me and tell me Ben, but well first you've got to take some some chemical engineering courses. And then you can learn about Dr. Skinner. You know, that, that's, that's as ridiculous as it sounds, as, as, as sort of the barriers that are being put in front of you to help. This, this, this to me, chalks up to what, what a lot of folks are calling, you know, the systemic ableism. Um, you know, and I think for folks that have been hearing this term for, for quite a while now, ableism out there, and, and, and I think a lot of people think, especially on the neurotypical side of things, think that autistic folk throw that term around as sort of a, you know, almost a, a, as a weapon of sorts. Um, but, um, uh, you know, I, I, which, which I don't like that term, uh, the we the weaponizing piece. I think it's just the fact that uh, folks are kind of getting defensive through that ableism piece. Um, what are your thoughts kind of, um, kind of shifting gears a bit on, uh, on, on this kind of ABA reform movement? There's been a lot of, obviously you're in the field. So I, I think, I, I, I presume you don't, consider what you're doing as abusive, um, um, you know, um, and, uh, and uh, I presume, you know, just talking about all the things you, you shared with me already, you know, you're, you know, sensory friendly, um, you know, you're ascent based, um, you know, uh, you're inclusive. I mean, you work there. Um, um, you know, it, it seems like you've kind of got all of the, all the ducks in a row to sort of be, you know, you know, a a you know a positive a positive learning experience um and yet there seems to be a lot of autistic folk um uh you know particularly you know just like yourself you know who also did not maybe did not have services themselves but are looking at this this sort of field and going you know the stuff you folks are doing are, is wrong. The stuff you are doing is sketchy and, uh, you know, and it really just needs to stop. Uh, do, do you have a perspective on that? And, 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 if, and it's okay if you don't, because I know there's a lot, there's, there's a whole, I know there's one autistic group out there that I, I forget the title of the, of, of, of the Facebook group name. It's, 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 it's several words, but it's something to the effect of, you know, the autistic community doesn't speak for me 
group, which is a really, yeah, yeah it was a really interesting group because it's it's a bunch of autistic folk. They're like, no, that's not what I think, you know, and it tends to be sort of a, a safe place for folks to kind of go and and get away from because there seems to be a lot of autistic autistic versus autistic, you know, kind of stuff happening too. Which you know, I, I'm just used to the the autistic folk coming at me as 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 a behavior analyst and 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 telling me that you know. You know, as it's sort of a you know a non autistic behavior analyst, um, and telling me that I'm doing everything wrong, but to actually have autistics kind of coming at autistics. What what's 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 been your experience with all of this stuff, and 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 what 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 what, what end have you come out on? I think there's two things feeding into it right now. So if you didn't know anything about ABA, if you didn't have any experience with it, you had just heard about this horrible, terrible thing on the internet that affects people just like mm. you. And you type in ABA therapy in a search box in Google or YouTube or wherever, you know, wherever it may be. The first few videos that come up, I mean, most of the videos that come up are pretty horrific. Um, they're just, they're compliance based. They, you know, there's a lot of DTT. There's a lot of robotic praise. It's just, it's not a good situation. And so if I were somebody coming into it who didn't know anything about ABA and that's what I saw that ABA was, I would probably hate it too. Mm. Um, additionally, and I you know, might get canceled for saying <laughs> this, but it's, it's true when you get a bunch of people together who all struggle with perspective taking, you're going to have conflict. We see it here. The only students here are students on the spectrum. There is conflict to be had all day, every day. So sure, it's sensory friendly for this guy, but that guy needs the lights on. And there's not going to be very much compromise that they're going to facilitate between the two of them independently. And you had better assist because someone might get hit. So, and I mean, I think we're seeing the same thing online Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. You know, and, 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 and I, I may get canceled here too and get some letters because I'm there. You kind of opened the door for me to say something that I, I've been wanting to say on the podcast, but I haven't had the right guest to talk to this about. And you definitely seem like the right one. Um, and that's the so some again and 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 kind of going back to you know some of the things you said I love on the spectrum around um you know being literal um and uh, and, and needing that structure um and you didn't say this but I've heard other autistic folks say you know that the thinking is a little more kind of kind of concrete um uh, um you know the, a little more black and white and that sort of thing maybe not all that to that extreme it seems to me that it's possible that if you like you say if you have a bunch of people in a room maybe this is just what you just said and i'm saying this in a different way but if you have a bunch of people in a in a chat room so you know no no nonverbals, no you know body language just text and we know that text is basically you know words are sort of seven percent of communication as they say and it's nonverbal language is the rest and paraverbals how you say what you say tone of voice all those sorts of things none of that comes out um on facebook or social media or whatever all you unless someone unless someone uses caps lock or 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 maybe tries to throw an emoji in here and there to sort of you know suggest a tone um you put a bunch of folks in, in, in a room that are, are black and white thinkers, literal, um, and and only using text. Um, it's difficult to have, you know, conversation and debate, um, you know, in, in that context. Like, I, I wonder if, if that is, is – I wonder if folks kind of realize that when – as they're – engaging with each other like i don't know like i don't imagine you're thinking when you talk to another autistic person you know you're literal too you know you're just you're just you're just having that engagement you know um well i don't think anyone joins an online debate to be able to concede to the other side and that's autism or not no mm. one's in it to you know oh you know what you're right no that's not going to happen mm. in any context mm. online so it's just not particularly you know a helpful debate or because no one is going to change right that. so it's not even the autistic characteristics per se and more so just the the format of online communication but then the other piece is and i think you're doing this you're doing this in a different way because you're using video you know in your in your storytelling and your and in your in your in your, in your dissemination um um 
The second secret word is dog. Like, I'm wondering, would these folks even have these conversations in real life? You know? I don't know. Yeah, it's hard to say. Um, and so what's, what's your feeling kind of on that? So like for, for, you said DDT. Now that's something or DTT. I think what well, was I think DDT is a, a, an ant killer, but um, um, the DTT is um, um, discrete trial training. And you were sort of saying that folks are using a lot of that, but isn't DTT like a big part of ABA therapy? Like what's the problem with a lot of DTT? I think the quality of DTT needs to be called into question. Mm. Um, I've seen some really, really good quality DTT, and I've seen some really, really bad quality DTT. Mm. Um, I think it's really beneficial. I think it's necessary in a lot of cases. I It's something I use with my clients. I'm particularly good at implementing mm. it. Um, that said, if it's not quality DTT, if your learner isn't motivated, it's going to mm. be problematic. And just again, for the folks that are, if we do have folks that are listening that aren't into ABA, DTT, so we talked about, I said I was going to write this down, but I'm going to say this. We have, we have DTT, which is discrete trial training, right? We have mm -hmm. NET, which is natural, natural environment, environment training. training. Um, you talked about SBT, which is from Hanley, and that's, what's that? Skill-based Skill -based treatment. treatment. So that's different. The T stands for something different there. So with discrete trial training, the uh, this is the idea of, and and for folks, you know, if you if you kind of YouTube it, uh, this generally generally involves a table of some sort, but I guess it doesn't always have to. Um, um, and in fact, maybe for some folks, the table is part of that compliance sort of in enforcing issue by kind of keeping someone in the corner and preventing escape. But then I think other folks think the table is just to sort of mimic what elementary school might look like because they have tables in elementary school i'm not really sure what the why there's a table um um is 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 what it is discrete trials so each trial has a beginning a beginning and an end you give some sort of instruction um the individual is expected to engage in some sort of behavior and then that behavior is reinforced and that's essentially a trial is that is that am i getting that right yeah, at its core, definitely. Yeah, so that's what DTT is. And so there's a lot of folks that think too much of that is a problem. And 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 why is that? Like why do you why is too much DTT a problem? I think the big issue, the big criticism and it's correct is that it's repetitive. Mm -hmm. Um and it's not naturalistic. No one is going to ask you to match colors 10 times a day in no context will you ever see that or will you ever have mm -hmm. to do that? Um, and I definitely agree, but the flip side of that is if that's something that somebody is struggling with, giving them more opportunities to practice is only going to be helpful. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. You had talked about, um, um, some of the sort of you're talking about kind of some of the sort of systemic kind of ethical issues for for RBTs related to a support group. Do you remember? Yeah, oh, yeah, the RBT support group on Facebook. What, what's that about? What, what's 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 going on there? What's 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 sort of the the, the potential problems with something like that? Uh, I think it's just like a scream for help, honestly. Mm. Um, there's a lot of shady companies out there still, mm. um, a lot of shady practices out there, a lot of BCBAs who've taken on way too many mm. kids um, and maybe aren't even skilled enough to know what to do with them. And they've got all these RBTs who are in, frankly, dangerous positions who are asking other RBTs who are also in dangerous and unskilled positions. Hey, I've got this kid who does X, Y, Z, and I just don't know what to do. So I've been doing this terrible thing. What do you think? Mm. Um, and you know, nothing really productive comes from that. And that's either. a group that doesn't, that only allows RBTs to be in the group, right? So BCBA. Yeah. They'll check your credentialing. They'll go look you up. So if you've got anything more than an RBT, you're not right, allowed in. Right. So BCBAs can't come in and provide the sort of, you know, potentially needed clinical support for those things because I suppose the group is intended to be a safe space for RBTs to sort of vent about 
you know, their experiences at these shady organizations. And if you bring the BCDAs right. in, then they're kind of, you know, at risk of losing their jobs. Is that sort of the thought? I would guess so. Um, I don't know that Facebook is the place for clinical <laughs> advice. So I think just well the said. whole thing is problematic in general. Yeah. yeah. But I think this speaks to sort of the issues around reform. And then and, and the reasons why maybe folks in other countries you know, don't understand it so well. Like, I, I recently heard, you know, in the news, and, and this will date kind of when we're recording this episode, was that there was three really large ABA organizations in the States that suddenly laid off, like, yeah, I a saw ton that. of folks. Um, and uh, and there seems to be this sort of, um, this sort of, uh, what do you call it? Uh, um, well, a lot, a lot of ABA seem, just seem, seems to be about money making in the states, you know. And these companies just get bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more for profit. And uh, and it's it's less about values. It's more about you know the dollars they bring in, um, and that leads to kind of some of these sort of shadier, shadier groups. Um, it, is this is this why folks are thinking ABA needs to be reformed, or is it just because of the videos on YouTube when you look it up that are, that get the most hits? Like, what 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 do you think is 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 sort of, you know, the reason that now it's suddenly a, a huge problem? I think the roots of ABA are relatively problematic. Hmm. Um, I want to say it was Skinner. There's a quote out there. Um, that says if you're working with an autistic child, you've got the, the components of a human. So he's got an eyes and a nose and a mouth, but you're basically starting from the ground up when you're working with an autistic person. You basically have to teach them how to be human um, or something to that effect, which is deeply problem problematic. And that's kind of where our roots are. Um, and I could definitely see how people would not like that. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of companies have way 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 move past that i mean you mean to tell me that the roots of modern medicine are ethical because they're not um right. however there are still clearly this is evident by the facebook group a lot of companies operating with these terrible terrible mm. practices and so yeah people are gonna hate us and that's why i'd hate us too yeah i guess just like you do have rogue doctors that are sort of practicing medicine without licenses and uh or or, or doing other things that they're not supposed to do um, you know that that that's not going to fare well. I had uh, 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 Tiffany Hammond on on the podcast uh, a while back. Uh, she has the moniker Fidgets and Fries uh, on Instagram and whatnot, mm -hmm. and uh, it's interesting. She said the almost exact same thing you said. She really and, and she actually wrote a really compelling essay about the roots of of, uh, uh, of ABA. And then, and she 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 uses the the uh, sort of a, a metaphor of the tree, and that uh, you know the, the roots of the problem are all of these are basically all the isms that are out there, you know ableism, racism, classism, the patriarchy, you know the you know men kind of ruling, sexism, those sorts of things, and ABA is just one leaf in the tree, like you say, and as you know it can happen in medicine, it can happen in any kind of field. Um, and they've all started kind of from those same sort of problematic roots and um, and sort of recognizing that. But I think you're right. I think there are companies out there that are, the ones that are really defensive about it are the companies that, you know, are, seem to that, that have moved past those practices. But then the ones that aren't speaking up and, and, and aren't defensive about it are, you know, are, are, are kind of those companies that, um, you know, are, are a little more shady and still kind of following that route. Yeah, it's it's. It's uh, it would be a really interesting experience to work in in the U.S. system. I think because I think there's just there's just way too many agencies out there. But maybe maybe still not enough. I don't know. Yeah, people would argue there's probably still not enough because, and also you know, being an RBT is not the most profitable job in the world. None of the RBTs are in it for the yeah. money. We're a nonprofit. Right. Oh, okay. Um, so we don't really we don't really experience any of that. Yeah. 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 So what uh, what kinds of areas you know you you kind of told us kind of the kind of work you do at the school you've been doing this for seven years what what kind of areas of ABA 
or, or of the field, I guess, in general, are you, are you kind of most passionate about, interested in? Right now, I'm really interested in skill acquisition. I think probably if you'd asked me that this time last year, I would say that I was interested in intensive, you know, dangerous behaviors. Mm. Um, kind of been there, done that, and on to the next mm. thing now. So all of my clients are really language abled and are trying to kind of get their skills up to the, where they can be in a more mainstream educational setting. Because academically, the clients that I work with are at grade level or in some cases above grade level, but are missing some other components um, to be able to be successful in those environments. So what kinds of skills are you teaching? It's a lot of self-management, self-monitoring, um, emotional regulation, impulse control sort of thing, social cause and effect, um, maintaining friendships, maintaining relationships, rule following when appropriate, self-advocacy, um, assertiveness, that sort of thing. I hear a lot of uh, autistic BCBAs in particular or, or, or BCBAs with ADHD. Um, I run a Facebook group called Behavior Analysts with ADHD and uh um which you'd be welcome to join rbts are also welcome um uh and they always are are reflecting on how on how bad of a job they do with themselves compared to sort of the folks they serve um and that you know that they or or with their own children you know for that matter um you know and i'm not saying they they do bad but that's just sort of their self-reflection have you do, do you find yourself um sort of developing new skills growing and changing and, and and sort of you know learning more learning about yourself by working with these kids oh yeah i think i've kind of picked up on a lot of the things because to be able to teach it you have to know it right and some of the concepts that i've been required to teach are things that i had never heard of mm. before um before coming into the field so i have learned to pick up on these things quickly so that i can be able to teach them but i will say that it's been helpful for me as yeah. well and so did you kind of looking at this, looking at, so look, here's a question for you. Being, you know, now in the field for, you know, a, a, again, a good long time. Like, uh, again, I think that's, um, you know, that, that just shows your dedication. Um, do you think ABA would have been good for you if you got into it when you were in early intervention? Like if you did early intervention, the whole nine yards, do, do you think, do you think it would have been good for you? Do you think, you know, and I'm not asking you if you say, you know, if, if you think you'd be a better person per se, but do you think you'd be a, a different person than you are today if you had gone through ABA? I think my life would have been significantly easier, especially, you know, in my adolescent years. I think, you know, if I had had some of those skills and if my family had more of that structured support, my life could have been a little easier and I wouldn't have had as many social struggles as mm. I did. And, 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 and so being diagnosed at 10, and, and again, I, I, I'm not trying to sort of, um, um, you know, criticize your, your parents or anything. I mean, it sounds like you had a great, uh, you know, you know, it sounds like you've got a really great family, a really supportive family, and, uh, and, and you grew up, you know, in a really, you know, nurturing household and all that. Do you know why they didn't put you in any kind of services when you were 10, like once you got diagnosed? Or... or they said that, I mean, outside of just the on and off OT and speech that I got, um, there really wasn't any availability for ABA services, especially for somebody that had the language that I did. I, mm. I actually spoke early as a child mm. and I spoke fluently and it was in sentences and it was intelligible. And so there really wasn't a place for me in those services where there would be no, today. I see, I see. Hmm. Because the services back then were mostly focused on folks that had maybe more of an intellectual disability or a speech delay. Is that sort of the, that, yeah, that was I the therapies so. that the were time. available. I gotcha. I gotcha. Right on. Right on. Interesting. Well, I know um, one thing for sure that you, you said on the show um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and I kept in my head was that you're, 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 you, 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 you like, you like structure, you, you like time management and sticking to where you are. And I know you told me, you're only available from 12 to 1.30 uh, my time, and I know we're at five minutes from the 1.30 mark, so I don't want to create any anxiety by going over time there. Um, and also, I know you're at work, so you probably have to get back to work at some point here. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I want to I wanna kind of thank you for coming on the show uh, and for just sort of sharing your perspective. 
Um, and uh, oh, you know, actually, one one thing I did want to ask quickly was, um, uh, or or just mention maybe. Uh, I know you're uh, obviously I know you're a big fan. Of, you're, you're you have a, a you're a big interest in birds um, and, and and dogs. Um, uh, if you came out my way, you'd you'd you'd, you'd be in bird heaven. Um, um, uh, uh, if Google the oyster catcher. Oh my God. Amazing creature. Um, but, um, have you ever looked at kind of uh, apply an ABA to, to that area of working with dogs or birds? The third secret word is hope. Yeah, I think specifically in my area, the the market for dog training is just really oversaturated mm. right now. Um, so it's really competitive and usually somebody, it's not necessarily the person with the best skills comes out on top. It's the person who's better at marketing mm. and who's better at dealing with people. Mm. Um, and that's just not something I'm interested yeah, in doing. Fair enough. I have seen there, there is, and, 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 and if I think of it, I'll send it to you. There is, um, I don't know if I have the book here, but there is uh, uh, some, some behavior analysts that are doing bird work. Um, which, uh, you know, you, you might find interesting. Um, and there's some neat folks that are doing, uh, some really neat research right now with, in, um, in, uh, animal shelters, uh, essentially training, uh, aggressive dogs and cats, um, to be more adoptable, um, using kind of ABA and whatnot. So that might be an area to kind of, to kind of venture towards too one day. Um, anything, anything else you kind of would like to share sort of about ABA and your, your, and, 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 and kind of the work you're doing, um, and, and for folks out there listening, I'm going to share all of the sort of social media and different things that you're involved in. I know you've got a, a, lots of followers and lots of folks doing things, and I'm sure you're going to get a lot more once this podcast comes out. Um, um, but yeah, and, and any kind of last words for, for the crowd? You know, I would have some, but my computer battery is about to die, so... I don't want to lose the Okay, recording. win-win. Okay, so the two minutes has, has multiple meanings today. Well, thanks so much for being on the podcast, Kaylin. Thanks for Cheers. having me.